our spotlight, we have Graham Boyd's Glasswork. Hello, Graham. Hello. Hello. How are you this <laughs> Very morning? Good. How are you? I'm good. So this is your first exhibition with the Alberta Craft Council. It and is. It's very exciting. I'm very excited. Um, you did have a piece previously in our coming up next show, yes. which is our emerging, emerging artist shows for uh, artists from across Canada within the first five years of their practice. Yes, so, I did. So um, I like to talk all the way back from the beginning <laughs> of time. So are you from Calgary? Yes, I am from Calgary. Born and raised and lived here my whole life. I was fortunate enough to go to AU Arts here in town, so didn't really have a reason to leave quite yet. I've been around, but <laughs> never quite moved anywhere, so born and raised in Calgary. Well, and yeah. we're lucky to have AU Arts here as a oh God, yeah. facility and a nice, easy access for artists. Um, I noticed on your resume that you have two degrees. That, uh, I do. Is your first one in glass? Yes, the first one was in glass, so I took, oh, I, I started ACAD in 2015, when it was ACAD at that point, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I knew I always loved art. I always loved painting, drawing, you know, creating things with my hands. And then within the first semester, I discovered glass and kind of fell in love with it. And I ended up being, I wasn't really good at it when I started, but I ended up having a little bit of a proficiency in it, I guess. I picked it up a little bit quickly and that allowed me to kind of enjoy it even more you know I, I wasn't as I got frustrated but I was like I still love this and so what do you think you loved about it like what was there something did you use different kinds of tools before or? um I don't really know like I think well it's it's like magic right it's like alchemy like the traditional form of alchemy is what glass blowing is basically and but I think it was the big thing that attracted me to it was the like the immediacy of it you had to you couldn't like step away you couldn't leave you had to what you started you had to finish I guess and making the like the something a tangible like tactile 3d object from nothing like a pool of glass was pretty pretty amazing to me and to to achieve that and like get to a point where well for the first three years you don't really know what you're doing but um after like the three four year mark then you're like wow i can make what i want to make kind of and at that point you're like well this is kind of what i really want to do for a long time, if not the rest of my life. So, did you take a, uh, the first year glass blowing class? Is that yes? I took the first year glass blowing class, and then that's only like a one semester course. So then, after, usually you have to wait a whole other year to start your second year. But I was like, I need to be in this. I need to. I can't wait a year. I need to be in this as soon as I can. So I talked to the head of the craft department, and they got me into the second year course, even though I was a first year. And then from then on, I kind of just continued on as fast as I could. And with going fast, it was kind of a catch-22. I finished fourth year when I was in my third year of studies. So I kind of just kept on taking classes. And I ended up taking five years to do my degree just because I wanted to spend as much time in the studio as I could and spend as much time as I could focusing on the things that I wanted to focus on rather than rushing and like kind of cramming my schedule in. So I took as many glass classes as I could. And then within that time, I kind of became a more sculptural artist, like, or my work became more conceptual, conceptual and like sculptural. So I started to take sculpture classes, and within that time, I built up enough credits in the sculpture department to kind of feed into a whole other sculpture degree. So, what do you think taking sculpture did? How did it expand what you were making? Oh, that, that's a good question. I feel like it um, it made me think outside of glass. I guess, like, as a glass blower, I'm your fix, immediate fixation is, I should make this out of glass, you know? And whereas a lot of the work that I was doing, which is much more like phenomenological or optical based or like material properties, the glass was kind of like the, the thing that made the most sense. And with, with its optical properties, it made a lot of sense for what I was doing. But after that, I was like, oh, there's more things that I can focus on that I can kind of dive into that like I started to use water, started to use just light and shadow in general, and that I still have a, a strict like basis in glass blowing, but I think there's sculpture allowed me to kind of view things outside of the, the formal glass world and be, question why I was making what I was making out of the material I was making it out of. So, uh, so you added light, water, did you add any other wood, um, ceramic? And metal, it, it's more so like the, um, the like subsidiary materials became more just tools, I guess, like things to 
make structures or to hold things or to make fixtures out of. So like a lot of it end up, like with, with the glass um, conceptual work I was making, it was very, very much about the optics, about the light, about the, the thickness of the glass or the way the light bends through the glass or filling a clear glass with water, how it kind of turns it into a solid glass object without having the weight of a, of a solid glass object. And with that, I really gained an affinity and attraction to light and what light can do in like the bending of light. So I started to use water and e even in some research like using plastic or found glass rather than glass that I've made myself and just kind of removing myself a little bit and letting the materials that I use do a little bit more talking rather than, oh, I have to make this. I have to, I have to be the one in control, right? Like, and kind of being in, in control in a sense, but not in all aspects, I guess. Interesting. Um, glass uh, seems to be a community because you have to work together to make glass. Yes. And uh, in, I think, 2018, you went um, to the Glass Art Society Conference in Murano, Italy, yes. which was a once-in-a-lifetime kind oh, of yeah. thing. So how did being in that greater worldwide glass community with all these amazing makers um, influence you? Um, it's really hard to say. Like, it was, I think, one of the most fascinating things for me with that was... The amount of people that go to the glass conference that just like glass. They aren't even glass makers, they aren't artists, they aren't, they're like, oh, I just have been following. Patrons, we need those. Yeah, oh, we love it, <laughs> I, I, yeah, we need those. But um, it was, I was like, oh, so do you, do you blow, what kind of work do you make? And they're like, oh, I don't make glass, I don't blow glass at all. I'm like, that's very strange. Like, it's not, or to me, I was like, I am so enthralled with this material and I love making it, I love using my hands within it. And it's just, it was very odd and, it wasn't a, obviously a negative thing, but it was, it opened up my eyes a little bit. I'm like, wow, this is the amount of people that can be affected by the glass world and the yeah. community. And just being in, I think it's, I think I had a little bit of a surreal experience compared to like other glass conferences. Not that other ones are worse necessarily, but being in Murano where like yeah. Western glass blowing as we know it. Like was magical. Exactly. And like be, it was like, it felt like Disneyland, but for glass, right? Like you go every corner you turn down, it was another glass studio or there's like mosaics on the wall of a small Italian alleyway that are of a glass maker. And so it was, it was pretty amazing to see like the, I guess the, one of the big things was like just how I feel like here we, we're like, oh, we're studio glass artists. We're there, it's just, they go to work, they blow glass, and then they go home. You know, it's very much like, it felt like any other trade, any other, like me, like a mechanic shop, it felt very, it made me view the material, the material and the, the art form in a different way here, like the, the function that it serves in culture and society, I guess. And it, it's very much less like, ooh, it's, don't get me wrong, it is a fine craft, it's a fine art form, but it's... A it, factory sort of exactly, thing, Exactly, right? yeah, yeah, and seeing that side of it kind of changed my view on how I'd go about making. And then, I, of course, I had, like, four more years left of school, so going back to that was kind of <laughs> weird to be like, ooh, the conceptual side, like, the making, making, and after being like, oh, this person's just making a beautiful $30,000 chandelier, like... Like it's nothing. Like they just. So is that do kind it. of production glass something you're interested, in or do you want to make just one of a kind art pieces? No, I'd say production is a thing that I I strive towards. I think it's one of the big things that I've changed in my glass practice is just kind of making things for the sake of making it, I guess, and getting like each day is going to be a little bit different. Like it'll be like, oh, today I'll make this, you know, and but then some I might have a series of different functional vessels that I might want to make in in a production form that I want to focus on but then not I guess not limiting myself is important because I think as a glass artist there's a multitude of ways that you can approach it like you can you can be strictly the sculptural um, like big large work that takes eight hours and then you're done and that's one piece in the course of like two weeks maybe and yeah. or you only make cups or you only make small functional wares. So I think there's, for me though, I love the ability to be able to kind of move between and navigate the, the variety of ways that you can approach class and the different objects that you can make. Well, and I'm assuming now because when you're a student, your, your studio fees included. Yes. Now you have to pay for every 
Yes. Every minute you blow. Exactly. So you it's, it's made me a lot more conscious yeah. of the things that I make. And yeah. fortunately, I, I am able to work and be a technician at a studio. So that kind of helps me pay for the work that I make at said studio. But it's, it's yeah, it definitely puts things in per, into perspective. And it, it makes me want to be back at school, but makes me happy that I'm not at school. Because I'm like, oh, I'm actually, everything I make is a little bit more meaningful. Or at least the intention is yeah. a little bit more there. And I can... Whereas at school, it's like, yeah, let's pour glass on the floor and see what happens. Whereas that would be a big waste <laughs> if I did that. That's yeah. an accident instead yeah. of an intention at, yeah. at school. Yeah. So uh, the Craft Council was lucky enough to go uh, and do a workshop at Fast Capital Glass, where Hayden, yes. uh, Hayden owns and where Graham works. And you got to teach. I did. Uh, so I how, taught you. Yes. yes. Well, how, and how does that um, change how you think about your practice? Is it fun to teach? Is it passing it on? I think, I th yeah, I think it's a lot of different things. I think the, the fun is the first big aspect of it. I love being able to share the art form and the material with people and, and my joy for it. I feel like people probably see like me being excited by somebody, what they're making and they're like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, this is great. You're doing a great job. But then it's also, um, I think it puts things into perspective for me like that I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to have learned and like progressed in this art form and have, have had access to it through the school because a lot of people are like, oh, I love it, but I've never been able to do it. I've never been able to touch it, never been able to see it, or I've only seen it on YouTube or on Netflix, right? And so I think the, the fortunate side of it tends to come out quite a bit. And I've always said like, like everybody kind of gets the opportunity to draw or paint or maybe even work with like plasticine or clay at home, right? But not everybody really gets the chance to blow glass. And I always wonder, you might be the best glass blower like in your generation, but you'd never get the opportunity to like touch the material or work with it. So you'd never get the chance to know that. And I think being a part of um, sharing the material in the art form with people is, is huge and expanding the, just expanding the community and because then somebody's like oh wow I can in a similar way to me where I'm like wow this is incredible and oh maybe I kind of have a hand for it then maybe I should give it a go like we have a we have a student at the studio that that comes in on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and his dad says it's like the cheapest thing that his, he can put <laughs> his son into rather than like hockey or baseball or like any of these sports that are really expensive and he's like it gets him moving it gets him thinking right it gets him yeah. excited which I think is it's, it's not rare to see, but it's rare for it to happen. I well, guess. and I think when people can see how things are made, they have a yes. whole appreciation for sort of the length yeah. of time and the skill that yeah. it takes. It's not as easy as it looks. Es especially um, with Christmas balls. Yeah. Like, that's the workshop, and it was, yeah. it, it's a specific amount of heat and time and air Fast. and pressure, and it's yeah. like, oh, it's done. There you go. Yeah. Or it's really not done. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lots of breakage. Yeah. Um, Melanie, if we can get a little closer and have oh. some closer look at your uh, the, the work you have here in your sure. spotlight. Um, and you can tell us a bit about some of the different forms and uh, styles and what you're thinking. Yeah, of course. Um, so you have kind of a neutral color palette. Yes, on this very side. much so. So what is it about these colors? That... Um, I, it's really hard to say. I've found in the last like year, I've I've gained a huge attraction and affinity to like, just like neutral or like darker transparent colors. Like I think something about like dark browns, dark blues or dark greens or grays, maybe like a transparent dark purple. I don't have any dark purple work here, but that's something that I am very attracted to in terms of my aesthetic. And during school, as we'll see in a little bit, I was working with um, a lot more opaque colors like bright opaque like right. kind of pop arty colors and more akin to like graphic design say like shapes and forms and like very like in your face kind of but I think I've moved into a more maybe traditional vessel type making rather than something being more conceptual I think just having the beauty of an object of the shape and the form of it and the 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 different depths within and thicknesses within the colored surface yeah, of the glass. Yeah, you the layer. This yeah. is a very uh, landscapey, natural kind of colors. Yes. Did you spend a lot of time outside in the pandemic? Um, yes and like, no. Is that part of your practice? I, I don't know. It's hard to say. Maybe it's like the times I've grown up, like being in Alberta, being out in nature and like just having 
an attraction to these kind of like mineral like um yeah. like landscape colors as you said but but then you, i guess the blue like this this really nice it's called seri blue it is it reminds me of water like a nice deep ocean and yeah also because yeah. um, we have so much light here the sun yeah. you know yes and yes then you've got glaciers and yeah. mountains yeah and anyway they're very beautiful pieces thank you and, um, the traditional form you write does lead to the layering of the one color through it and the depth of it. Yeah, and I think um, with the, um, like, a lot of the way the color comes out is much more, say, akin to, like, the process of actually making, whereas, like, like in a vessel like this, the, the body of the vessel is where it stretches the most, so that's where the color gets the most thin, but then that, um, that gradient of the thickness of the color near the, near the lip of the vessel down to the base is... I'm, I'm really a big fan of that. And it, no matter how much color you put on, it kind of always comes out. And I think it works, it works really well with transparent colors. Yeah. Like it, yeah, the color doesn't get too thin and it still shows that color. So you're through. starting with clear and then you're picking up another color and yes. putting that on top. Yes, Some, sometimes it's a color bar where I'll have my assistant melt a, heat of color, or a piece of colored glass and then we drop it over a bubble of clear glass and then you you heat it up, smooth it out, and then like encase it in more clear glass and then blow a vessel out of it. Or sometimes it's, it's frit, and, which is very fine. I, use, I like to use very fine, um, close to powdered colored glass, like chunks of colored glass. I guess it's not even chunks, it's, it's near powder. and that Kind of like sugar looking. Exactly, yeah. And it, it gives a nice even coating if you put enough on. <laughs> if you, the, the time that you spend the most in making a glass piece, or for me, is probably applying color. Like I could, yeah. if it was clear, it would be banging them out like crazy. But well, it is amazing how it blends. You have no idea that there's like these layers exactly. in there at all. Exactly, yeah, yeah. It's sort of in there. Agreed. And on the other side here, we have yes. something completely different. Totally different. <laughs> so no longer landscapey, more architectural. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so why these colors, poppy colors? What yeah, I don't, you to those? I don't know. I have, I think a lot of this comes from, um, like sketches that I do or like formulating work like on in the 2D I'd like I tend to draw my and like sketch my ideas for work from from like a side perspective right from a very 2D not in a 3D perspective and I think these shapes these forms and these colors kind of lends itself to that like blocky almost if you look at it if you look at a work from the side it kind of becomes its color and its shape and its silhouette it kind of it kind of flattens a little bit or that's that's the goal at least is I want to accentuate the the shapes that I use and the the blockiness of the color I guess and the the silhouette of the overall work yeah it's really uh interesting the architectural side of that and mm -hmm. uh how uh you're using maybe more of that sculptural degree when yeah. you when you're pulling these forms out? Yeah, I think that's where this really started because I was like, ooh, I don't, maybe I want to move beyond like the, um, move beyond the, oh, what's the way to put it? Like the, the optical properties of the glass, I guess, and use glass as more of a tool to let people like navigate, walk around space rather than like looking through the glass, like kind of paying attention to what's happening on the outside of the glass, if that makes sense. Yeah, so like no, kind it does. of and and again, like as I said, like in a in a hope of say these two objects on the left, the in a hope that they would maybe become flattened and allow people to kind of focus more on the shapes and the forms, maybe the shadows that are that are touching the surface of the glass. And then if they as they walk around the vessel, obviously there will be some aspects that are handmade. It's not perfect. I think that's that's the joy of being a craft person is being like, oh, it's not perfect, but I did make this. And it's, yeah. it's I like to see the hand of the maker. I'd like to well. know it's not from a mold or me as well. anything yeah. else. And like, why, if I really wanted these to be perfect, why not make them out of wood or make them out of metal? If I wanted them to be like really clean and perfect and like, like yeah. really sharp, really, yeah. So. A nod back to the molten state. Exactly, yeah. Well. yeah. well, that's all questions I have for you yeah. today. Yeah, amazing. Um, uh, the spotlight's great. It uh, will be here for two months. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you're here before March 18th, uh, come on down and see it.